said, Rosemary introduced us about nine months ago, and it's just been an incredible relationship that we've been building. So delighted to be here. Um, we basically, Working Nation is a not-for-profit media enterprise that I founded, uh, have pulled together an incredible team of uh, people to work with me on it. Matter of fact, sitting in the back of the room is Jane Oates. She's president of Working Nation. Uh, she lives in Washington, D.C., so bringing her on board kept me from having to keep flying to Washington. But uh, Joan is, uh, Jane is one of the most incredible, knowledgeable educators uh, from a, a governmental standpoint in this country. Uh, and she knows everyone. So uh, she's been an incredible, she's been with uh, us about four and a half years. Uh, Lonya Guha, who has a little face up in that screen behind that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Loni is chief of staff at Working Nation. She lives in the, uh, LA where I live. Uh, she works very closely with Jane and me as well as you know, the rest of the team. And what we have done is we've pulled together an incredible team of journalists, researchers, um, writers, etc. And I'm happy to say this month of September is the five year anniversary since we launched Working Nation. Uh, first content went up on CNN's platform in September of 16, and then Time Inc. and Fortune's platforms. And today we have you know, millions of views, you know, depending on the particular. And we have, um, I don't know, actually, Lonia, are you able to show the video? Yeah, let's start the video. Yeah, this will give you a little sense of what we're thinking about, and then I'll jump back in. No voice. No. I think you got unmuted or something. Well, we can talk through it. Okay. Anyway, this uh, video future proof, uh, we uh, well, we launched Working Nation, as I mentioned, in September of 16. The first piece we put up was called Slope of the Curve. And the reason we named it uh, Slope of the Curve was what happened is eight years ago, this coming October, I laid the beginnings of all this out at a uh, Deutsche Bank dinner where uh, uh, Larry Summers, former Secretary of the Treasury, was the guest speaker. It was the night before the US government might default on its debt and uh, it was filled with about 100, I, my guess is 150, this is in New York, major fund managers, top corporate executives. And I don't know, while I was sitting there, Dr. Summers spoke a lot about uh, China, he spoke a lot about default. I don't know why it came together, but it came together in my head. And when he opened it to questions, although the subject had nothing to do with the evening, I raised my hand, they gave me a mic, I was right in front of the podium. And I laid out for Dr. Summers the whole issue of four variables coming together like never before in history. Globalization, technology, longevity, and broken education, particularly how fast those other three were changing the world. And by the way, this was all before the pandemic, uh, which I can't believe I never thought about a pandemic factoring in here. But uh, anyway, very nice, another visit. Hi there. Um, so uh, I laid this out to Dr. Summers and uh, yeah, you know, interesting back and forth, but then he had to jump back into the fact that uh, the US government might default on its debt the next morning. Anyway, seven different guys in the audience that night, none of them knew me, uh, chased me down and basically said, I can't believe I've never thought about this. And I said, Wow, if the giant fund managers and top corporate executives aren't thinking about the average American is. And I really believe we're focusing in on, I think, the most critical issue facing our nation. Uh, as I have found, as I've gone up and down Park Avenue in New York or you know, other places, a number of times I would lay this out and whoever I was sitting with, they'd either 
say it or send me a follow-up email say all right i can't believe that you've opened my eyes to the world that my children and my grandchildren will be living in and i really believe over the next you know 10 and 15 20 years you're looking at unemployment has had the potential of looking at unemployment rates of 20 25 35 40 percent and if you think about it that way, then you can look at this long, you know, very interesting agenda of speakers today and topics being discussed. What happens in that environment? I should give you a little bit of background. I come out of the investment world. Uh, I was an investment banker at uh, Drexel Burnham uh, from the very early days and uh, running uh, co-head of uh, corporate finance. Uh, I ended up doing a lot. The reason I, the idea of creating a not-for-profit media enterprise here isn't that crazy. It's because in 1985, I met a really interesting guy. His last name was Turner, first name Ted. And I was investment banker for Turner, became investment banker for Turner Broadcasting. I helped them buy MGM. I, uh, uh, I, I was the one who figured out how to keep CNN out of bankruptcy in late 88. I was the one who brought in Hanna-Barbera so we could start the Cartoon Network to, that led to a lot of other media stuff. And then post Drexel, uh, I'm one of the founders of Apollo Advisors. Um, and there, particularly in the early days, did a lot of buying up a lot of the bankrupt and near bankrupt companies, particularly in my case, media. And we ended up buying up two TV broadcasters, broadcasting companies, one healthy, we merged it with one healthy one. And then courtesy of a quarter of a billion dollar check from Rupert Murdoch, we changed all the affiliations to Fox and created the largest Fox affiliate group of TV stations. And I went in and actually ran the company for about two and a quarter, two and a half years. So the idea of creating a not-for-profit media enterprise to educate this people in this country as to what I believe is the most critical issue we face, it's not that crazy. You were Ted's investment banker and uh, Ted still used to, he's, he's not well known. But used to refer to me, it's written up in books as the spud web of investment banking. So that's <laughs> one of my pride, pride and my, one of my glories. Ted was a fascinating guy. But anyway, Rupert also, these, those two guys basically have had such, in, such influence in this country and obviously the uh, global. Anyway, so I did a lot of media. So it's not that crazy. I started a media enterprise. Post my TV days, I entered the tech world courtesy of a company called Akamai Technologies. Some of you may be aware of it. I was uh, one of the original uh, investors. I was vice chairman. I was a guy who raised many of the monies, uh, much of the monies, drove the IPO. I was also doing a lot of the business development because of my ties to you know, so many of the big media companies, including I walked Akamai into CNN. Uh, that wasn't very hard. Uh, I, so I, my deep involvement, I knew nothing about technology before that, but obviously I learned a little bit. Uh, fast forward, I did a lot of subsequent venture capital tech related investing. And that very much is what opened my eyes to how fast technology is changing the world we live in uh, and jobs. Uh, and then one other thing I'll mention, third leg on the stool, Mike Milken in 02 called me up and asked me to invest in an online education company that he and his brother and Larry Ellison of Oracle were funding. Bill Bennett, former Secretary of Education, was the uh, founder of the phone Ron Packard. And I was all, because of my Akamai experience, I was already thinking about how do I deliver the incredible education my three kids were getting at the finest private schools in LA? How do I de deliver it 100 miles, 1,000, 10,000 miles away? And so when Mike asked me to invest, I didn't know if I was going to get money, but I said, I will, but only if I can go on the board and on the executive committee, because I want to learn. And uh, I did learn a lot, stayed on the board for six years and went off right before the company went public. It's a company called K-12. And uh, that was my opening to the ed tech world. And I would say probably my most significant investment area these days is ed tech. Um, and... <coughs> What a very key reason, three motivations that have driven me in the working nation. First is, as I mentioned earlier, slope of the curve. The change in jobs and skills when measured against time has never been so steep. And as a dean at NYU said to me about nine months ago, Art, 
the slope of the curve has gotten a lot steeper courtesy of the pandemic. Second motivation of uh, you know, why I'm doing this and why we are all doing this is this time it's about the heart of America. And what I'm talking about, the two examples I use all the time is the driverless vehicle. The number one job in 32 states in this country, and I don't know, it's five or 10 or 15, 20 years, how many years going, uh, it will be, but those jobs are gonna disappear. And those are middle-class jobs in this country. And okay, what are all these people you know, gonna go off doing? My thought for a long time, and I'm glad they're talking about it now, was rebuild the infrastructure. That was actually a thought that I've had a number of years ago. Anyway, uh, but the other example I've used a lot is how a marketing department of 10 will become a marketing department of two because of data and analytics. And those eight jobs disappearing in a terrific white collar, middle-class and upper middle-class jobs throughout this country. And, uh, it's an area I know a fair amount about. I'm the founding funder uh, of the Wharton School's whole data analytics program dating back to 2008. So it's an area, matter of fact, I was at Wharton this past Thursday <laughs> talking to them about all about the type of stuff that we're doing, uh, including the data analytics people. But anyway, those jobs that are, those eight jobs disappearing. As I say, they're terrific middle class and upper middle class jobs. Now, the good news is that people like that can get retrained because data and analytics is the, one of the fastest growing jobs. And this is why we started at the Wharton School. You know, within, my guess is within 10 years, there won't be an aspect of business, government, or the not-for-profit world that isn't driven by data and analytics. Today, if someone comes out of, you don't have to come out of MIT or Wharton. You come out of a community college program that has, you know, some data and analytics that, emphasis or a certificate program, you could walk into a job uh, immediately and get paid substantially more than you can get paid at any other job. There's a total vacuum of, uh, and so those, so those are the types of things. So back to the mission of working nation, those are the types of things that we're looking for. Yes, first we'll scare the hell out of you. That, that would do, and this, is, this would have, the video would have if it, if it played, so obviously, are, uh, obviously, we're, we're not great at technology, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but uh, it is, let me, oh, I was going to add one more thing, a real motivation. This is why I was talking about ed tech before. Um, real motivation of ours, and we've discovered this along the way, never before have we had to reskill and re-educate all the 48-year-olds. And I use 48 to you know, represent people outside of normal academic years, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And that is a reality. And no, you're not putting them back in the classroom. Uh, and so the whole area of ed tech is, uh, I think, a very important place. And so separate from working nation, that's a key area that I do spend a good bit of time investing. Um, Anyway, oh yeah. Yep. Anything from a slide standpoint? Do you see the slides? I see the one who we are. Yes. Okay. Uh, so as I've said, media had edge. I want to mention three audiences we're going after. First of that is that audience, those guys who chased me around the Deutsche Bank dinner. Because if they understood, they could make something happen. They can walk into the head of HR, you know, the company they're running, and say, hey, you see what so-and-so company is doing? Why can't we do something like that? Worst case, they could write a check to a solution. And by the way, we're very focused in this key mission of ours, solutions are local. It's what companies are doing, what not-for-profits, what academic entities, what local government do. Uh, that's where the solution is. It's not to say that federal policy and money can't have a lot of influence. Sure, it can. But the one, that's not where we're spending our time. But two, the solutions themselves are local. And so what we at Working Nation are doing is, one, searching for where the jobs of today, tomorrow, and the future will be. And then the, the mitigating strategies and solutions. And we're in the business of telling those stories 
as I said, audience one being the guys who chased me around in Deutsche Bank dinner. Audience two are those who are working on solutions because they can learn from each other. And we've seen great examples of where content of ours went up with regard to an incredible uh, internship type program, a company called Year Up. You may be familiar with it. We told the story. And when we told the story, the average, an average billionaire in Detroit didn't know me, but through some other acquaintances contacted me. One basically she said, can you put the head of my foundation in touch with the year up people? I said, yeah, I can probably do that. Hopefully some people come to that. Um, anyway, so uh, it's, we're searching for that. And we have the four strategies that we have highlighted here. We started out with video storytelling. And I'm not talking about 90 minute documentaries. I'm talking about you know, short, anywhere from 90 seconds to 10 minute, uh, you know, video storytelling. And obviously in today's digital world, we have a lot of access out there. Uh, second, journalism. We have an incredible team of journalists. Uh, Ramona Schindelheim, our editor in chief, a long career in journalism. Uh, she heads all of that up. She also heads up the podcast strategy. Today, we probably have a portfolio of about 150 podcasts by you know, real knowledgeable expert type people. Uh, if we showed you a list of the names, you'd recognize many of the names that uh, have recorded uh, with us. And then the other thing is live events. We've probably done 12 or 13 of these in different cities in, in, in cooperation with organizations in those cities on different workforce related subjects. Example, I mentioned the Wharton School. We did a town hall event and we film all those for future broadcasts. The Wharton School, um, you know, and we did a whole thing on data and analytics jobs. And yes, on the, you know, we had panelists from the uh, head of technology from Morgan Stanley. We had the CEO of the University of Pennsylvania Healthcare System key data analysis guy out of Comcast and others. And then our education panel, because these aren't just jobs, as I said before, not just jobs for Wharton or MIT people. So we had the president of the community college system on there. We had a, we had a, a woman out of the uh, Philadelphia education system, K through 12 education system. Uh, so anyway, we created that event. It was a blowout success. We've done the Bush Institute, we did, did a big thing on labor, on the veterans workforce related and uh, employment only, you know, focused on workforce issues and uh, opportunity. Uh, and then and a whole bunch of other, Milken Institute, in, uh, Los Angeles, etc. Uh, journalists and other all kinds of big media are now chasing us. And uh, Jane back there, she's probably once a week or maybe twice a week, she is being interviewed by, you know, PBS or, you know, one of, the, one of the news organizations out there. So we're getting a lot of major media following us. And the importance of what we're doing, and I'll tell you, as recently as, you know, this Sunday, this past Sunday, if you watch all the Sunday morning talk shows, uh, you know, news shows, if you watch them the week before, the week before, the week before, you watch them next week, you'll hear almost nothing about employment. It's almost like all the news people believe the Bureau of Labor Statistics ridiculous data that they put out. Um, it's clearly not, uh, you know, five, what is it? 5.7? Yeah, the number has been massaged many times. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, it's, anyway, so. Oh, can uh, I ask a couple of questions? Yeah. Yeah, Let's just go. jump in here. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you organize, like, you know, somebody worked with you to develop a campaign, you know, like video storytelling, et cetera. What kind of timing is it when somebody approaches you to start brainstorming things? And do you typically brainstorm it? Does your group typically, or do you, does the other person say, I've been thinking about doing this, you know, can we do something? Well, you put up the next slide. I think it's the next one. We have the themes up right now. I know, put up the next one. The uh, partners. The partner slide is up. Yep. So right to your question. Yep. This is an example of who we partner with. And I use the term loosely, uh, partner. Uh, some of them are key funders of Working Nation, including the Walton Family Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, Clint Eastwood, Comcast. Those are all funders. 
The others are all organizations that we partner with in terms of them pushing our ideas out, or we come up with ideas together and we push out. And a great example was five weeks ago, Jane got a call from a you know, senior person at the Federal Reserve Bank of the US and asked that Working Nation would do a, a Twitter chat on September 1st with some of the Fed banks. Uh, as I told Jane, yes, but only if they you know, ask them to, you know, if we can borrow a billion dollars at 0% interest. Um, Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but we still did. <laughs> anyway, so on, we were, and so the uh, it was Working Nation, the Fed Bank of Philadelphia, Atlanta, Kansas City, and then an umbrella organization of Fed banks. Working Nation is the only party outside of the Fed banks that we were you know, part of that. So we are, you know, and Milton Institute, we've done all kind. We have been the media partner with ASU GSV. Uh, for the last three years, including, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago down in San Diego. Uh, and we do all the interviews of, you know, top-notch people who are there talking about the areas that they're focused on from an employment standpoint. So you're really creating the narrative, massaging the narrative, making sure it fits to the to the audience that they're trying to reach, you know, et cetera, because that's, that's got to be the most impossible job in the world when people are talking about esoteric Fed strategies and, and trying to relate that to, you know, everyday things like jobs. Yeah, we, we're the one who translates it for these audiences. And so, as I said, the other second audience are those who are creating uh, solutions. Third audience, and it's obviously a critical one, mom and pop and young people across this country. You know, my data and analytics example, you know, I know about it, you know, we've done a lot. So the average mom and pop in Nebraska has no idea that their kid, you know, if they had in some exposure to data analytics can just walk into a job. So with, you know, Lumina Foundation is a major funder of ours. We've, they fund, they've provided funding in the last four years. Um, they love what we're doing. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them. <clears throat> they're from Indianapolis. They're headquartered in Indianapolis. As a result, uh, we did a big digital magazine on the middle class, the good, the bad, and the ugly from an employment standpoint in the city of Indianapolis. And uh, we're happy to forward that on to you. That was the beginning of what is really a strategy that we're focusing on, and that is finding other cities around the country where we ought to be telling the story of what's happening in those cities from an employment standpoint. And uh, as I said, the squeeze on the middle class, also, also the good things happening uh, in those cities. So we've got, yes. Mark, I'm just wondering, is there a way that you're measuring impact? For example, number of universities or number of corporations that you've reached or you see some change in data analytics in a certain locality uh, to let's say data analytics or some other jobs and are you measure, because obviously you're having a huge impact, what are the tricks that you're measuring? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, you know, as time goes by, the answer becomes more yes, yes, yes. You know, initially we were, you know, capturing eyeballs, our goal was to capture eyeballs. And it's still very much to capture eyeballs. But then there are also other equations that are now, you know, we're now focusing on. For example, uh, the last two Novembers, we dedicated um, the month of November to veterans workforce related issues and opportunities. Uh, Clint Eastwood stepped up with a giant matching grant. That is what helped bring in J.P. Morgan Chase, Comcast, Apollo, my former you know, fund this year, uh, a couple other investment groups. Um, this past November, 22 other organizations distributed our content to their audiences. So now I can start talking about measuring that because that is a key goal. That's a lot of reach. Getting other organizations saying, whoa. And uh, I'll be honest, we had a teacher from a high school, uh, high school in New York call us up last summer. And uh, I had met her about a year earlier. She said, Art, can we start putting your content 
working nation kind of up on our digital platform at the high school uh, for the students, the, te uh, the parents and the teachers. And at the same time, we got a big data study that we did with a very prominent polling organization. Last summer, we got all kinds of data. Our, our team and their team put together 70 or 75 questions to uh, on you know this workforce related uh, ideas, terminology, things like that. Uh, we got the data back uh, again last uh, August of uh, 20. I was blown away by the data that we got um, in many respects, but the number one thing that blew me away, 31% of the people who replied you know, to that polling event indicated that no parent or teacher had ever provided them with guidance with regard to employment. I was blown away, 31%. You're talking about almost a third of the population. And there's, there's so little information out there. I mean, that's part of it as well, right? That's I mean, it. your kid says, I want to go do this, like to art school. But then you say, what about, you know, media or short, you know, film, you know, things like that. I mean, so you have to understand that world and, and, and you guys step in and communicate that. Yeah, no, that's ex exactly right. But then my punchline on that is I always say, when I saw that data, I immediately thought, my father started working me over with regard to employment when I was about six months old. Pay the rent. I can't believe it. No, all, all kidding aside, it might not have been six months, but it was pretty pretty early on. Um, and I thank him for it. Uh, anyway, so that type of thing. So, you know, to your question, we're getting more and more data over time. At some point, we're going to really be able to do a, a much, much greater analysis of uh, what's happening. But you know, we 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 move along, and particularly when we start getting organizations like this, you know, deeply involved. This can be there's a lot more yeah. that we can do. Yes. So I, I want to ask you. So uh, we had to make contribution in our corporation, and you know, the the people in the company wanted to make a, a grow some trees and and. Um, Costa Rica or something. And I said, hey, you plant your own damn trees uh, in your own backyard. Y'all got acre lots. I says, we should go and we should go into San Francisco and give a couple of scholarships to poor black kids who are, you know, so they can, because public schools are basically closed. Uh, so we can teach them something and let's go tell them, mentor those high school students about what we do. You know, we've all got different backgrounds and stuff like that. So um, you know, the thing is, is that what I'm seeing is a lot of corporations are making broad uh, things that don't go good, but the one-on-one, -on -one, you go one-on-one -on -one things, and I started working at 10 years old. When we had I was 12. I started yeah. shoveling yeah. snow was when I was 12. Up, you know? <laughs> and then the bowling alley. But uh, it seems like I see today in, in East Palo Alto, I don't know where you... you I live in Los Angeles. Okay. And I grew up in East LA, so the same thing today. You know, you can go to East LA and there's whole families and nobody in the family works. And because they know the sweet spot to get whatever it is in terms of benefits and stuff. And it seems like you've got to get some role models in the community where there's somebody who's actually working, somebody that's gone. You know, this guy who went to school with him, which is almost did to stand and deliver when the kids started learning math. And so I think you really need those things, really. And it's almost like you've got to get some mentors to go back to the community and, and, and teach somebody instead of these, these corporations making these big global things that who knows where the money goes. You've got to well, go yeah, right in the community. You're making a great point, including yeah. one that I addressed this morning on a Zoom that uh, Jane and I were on. Um, if you go to so many corporations' websites, and you, whatever terminology they you uh, they use, you look at for the social responsibility, and what you will see on these days, you know, and, and rightfully, I'm not uh, objecting to it at all. You'll see all kinds of things about ESG. Yeah, yeah. and you know, terrific. I, you know, I do think we have uh, real issues. A uh, former partner of mine is the one who. Uh, created uh, Live Earth, the global concert, uh, where something like 4 billion people uh, watch with regard to it. 
Um, but I said to these people who I was on Zoom with this morning, I said, why, why isn't workforce development sitting on those, those corporate screens uh, all about uh, you know, social impact? It's such an obvious thing. And I don't care what corporation you're talking about, employment is part of what they live with every day. They got employees, good, bad, ugly, you know, what changes in there. And so uh, that's gonna be, I, you know, I, I thought of that, I presented that this morning to another organization. And uh, that's gonna be a new pitch of mine to <laughs> corporations. Uh, but to your point, we cover the full spectrum of society. So yes, we told the uh, story of the Akamai Academy that trains well-educated people uh, in cybersecurity skills. You know, unfortunately, one of the fastest growing jobs in this country. At the under, other end of the spectrum, we told the story of the last mile. Last miles of programs originally in San Quentin prison, training uh, inmates in entrepreneurship and coding, purpose being minimize the return to prison after release. And at least when we told that story, which was about five years into the program, no one who had gone through that program had been readmitted to prison at that time. The program has now been you know, spread out to other parts of the, uh, the country. So uh, you know, to your point, one, we're covering the full spectrum of size. And yes, we've got, give me, a, I, I made reference again to Year Up. Uh, year Up, is a not-for-profit, it's about 16, 17 cities. It provides a one-year program. You have to be in the bottom 20%, but you have to have a high school diploma. And what they do is they train you for six months inside year up, and then you get an internship in AT&T, JP Morgan Chase, et cetera. And the results are incredible for those kids. So many of them are then hired permanently. And a lot of those companies then put them through, you know, college, night school or, or whatever. That was one of the pieces we first told. I just have a quick comment. Yeah. Be your question. So, so my comment is that, you know, corporations can measure performance and analytics as much as they want, but it's like a 12 steps program. That's like step one. If you don't have like a plan of things to do to help things along, it's 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 worthless, right? So I think you guys are part of that whole thing and getting to through those 12 steps of exactly. you know participatory enablement of society. That's what I said. Okay. Yes. So, so I mean I, I agree with a lot of the stuff that you said that the name You don't agree with everything? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no I agree with it. I agree with everything, but I want to have some comments. So, you know, with the rate of change that's happening with technology like this, I know whether it's communication, whether it's you know, tomorrow it's the jobs in cybersecurity or robotics or data, you know, all of us agree with that. But then all the detailing sort of come out things that are like that, you know, maybe, you know, it's a balance, right? I mean, how many people coming out of high school understand the basics of finance? How many people even understand top one interest? And today, even your kid in Nebraska or whatever has access to the, you know, the whole world with the phone, right? So, and, and the other thing I would say is, you know, entrepreneurship, right? Uh, that should be more, and I think you alluded to, and more of- Well, that, that's an important theme of ours. Yeah, so, I mean, for, I think I, was, uh, I volunteered and I came on junior achievement. I don't know if they are aware of the program. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Partnering with them and doing things that you know, I taught in elementary schools and stuff like that, but that has to be done on a lot broader basis. And then a little bit of contra thought is, uh, you know, when you know Elon Musk and Jack Ma said AI and all the big changes happening, they said believe it or not, 20 years from now, the population collapse is going to be the biggest issue the world is going to face. So any comments on that? Because in spite of AI and you know, you know all the things of concerns that Elon Musk came out of about AI, right? He has things to make sure things on, but they said the biggest issue he can have. So your question is there's going to be a population collapse. Yeah, they said the biggest issue going to be facing the world is really population collapse. I'm not sure if it's a collapse as much as it's a the population is gonna get older. Yeah. And those will have to find a way to live. Right. Uh, no, I think the rate of population. 
right? Yeah, no, look, there, is, there, there are look, there are theories about you know training, but listen, I, just, I, I can't I can't predict everything that's going to happen you know, from a population standpoint. And by the way, we at Working Nation are you know only focused on the U.S., even though the subject we're talking about is widespread widespread across the globe. But uh, a guy asked me to speak a few years ago to speak at a Vatican conference about, all about this. And uh, he's very connected high up in the Catholic Church as well. I know him from the investment world. And I said, Jeff, I can only say one country at a time. But if you yeah. get me a one on one with the Pope, I'll do it. He didn't get me a one on one with the Pope. So I did. <laughs> I did uh, we, we do have a, a couple of minutes left, but uh, well, everyone's everybody here is going to dinner. So, you know, we can continue that conversation. Let me just, but, yeah. let me pull up yeah. a, another slide here. Uh, Loni, put up the uh, different themes, major themes that we're talking about these days. It's up. Okay. So it's just so right quickly, now. that gives you some, some things to think about. Major themes that we're focused on from an employment standpoint. And we're looking for the stories to be told so when we present a group like yourselves, we're looking for ideas. Uh, you know, that's we, you know, we don't know everything. We're, and that's how we really gotten so far. So we've got an incredible advisory board, executive committee, et cetera. Green jobs. You know, we, as I said, we did very successfully, did major things on uh, veterans, workforce related stuff. Green jobs, you're talking about one of the fastest growing job areas in this country. Uh, we've got a big data study going on now, thanks to the help of the Walton family. Uh, my, my wife and I funded a data study, but with these two research groups on green jobs, we funded Colorado and Pennsylvania. Okay, that was based on advice from the research, plus I have ties with both the states. Uh, Walton family came along fairly recently and they're funding the same research six states up and up and down the Mississippi. Uh, one of our executive committee members, Art Cohen, uh, he's in the healthcare area, but Jay and I went to see him about healthcare jobs, stuff we were doing, but he heard about the data study, said he wanted to do Connecticut, uh, where, where he lives. So we got 41 states left to go. So if you have any ideas of people like California, <laughs> it's top of the list. Anyway, green jobs, Besides the data study, all kinds of uh, you know uh, programming development that we're doing consistent with you know, the stuff we've done before. Uh, veterans, I've talked about entrepreneurism. To uh, your, I'm not looking to tell the Mark Zuckerberg story, okay? But local entrepreneurship is such a critical piece of employment. You know, whether it's LA where I live or up here in the valley or whatever. It's local entrepreneurs that do so much of the employing of it. Yes. Art, I'm wondering if you think, in your opinion, being a Wall Street veteran for decades and being in capital formation, if you think that one of the major problems with respect to entrepreneurism is the fact that early stage companies really can't get funding easily. There's crowdfunding and there's a few other new things. But I wonder what are your what's your opinion about uh, startups and, and, and their number one challenge? Well, I think you'd have to distinguish between the obvious things that, you know, you're talking about. And as I said, uh, I'm, I have a partner who works full time on uh, early stage investments, but we're looking for the things that are, you know, the, the giant, as opposed to the local businesses, local entrepreneurs who open a restaurant, to open, uh, you know, a gardening, you know, company. Uh, they end up employing all kinds of people who, you know, don't have the same, aren't going to be uh, building a rocket ship to, you know, go into space. Uh, that's where we're very heavily focused, where it's more, you know, for the average citizens, as opposed to, no offense to those who I'm standing in Silicon Valley with, uh, but that's less of our focus at this point. And so, yes, do I focus on that type of stuff from an investment standpoint? Yes, but not too much from a working nation uh, standpoint. Uh, anyway, entrepreneurism, I've described uh, veterans because of diversity and inclusion has been a big theme of ours even before the pandemic. Uh, lots of our stuff, women, blacks. I feel 
really odd. And we have done very little on uh, Hispanic workforce related issues and opportunities. And it's a massive issue, clearly, even before pandemic, but clearly the pandemic. And I feel like an idiot because I was the guy who bought up the majority of the bankrupt debt in 1992 of Telemundo. You know, I lived in LA, I didn't have to be so smart. Anyway, Hispanic workforce, we're going to be doing a lot. And also, going back to my example of the Sunday morning talk shows, you'll hear about Blacks, you'll hear about women, you'll hear about Asian, you hear nothing about Hispanics. So wait, anyway, it's going to be a big push of ours. Hispanics are working in gardening, and landscaping, doing their own business. The Republican Party is going to be Hispanic in 10 years because they don't want the regulations and they don't like the snippy little... Uh, politically correct people telling them what to do at it, the local government. And it's the large, you know, the, new, yeah. the census numbers that came out, it is the largest, uh, you know, group, or whatever you want to describe in this country, of after, after uh, well, but just population-wise, yeah. after. Uh, Mike Milken, who, um, Giselle Fernandez, one of our executive committee, she interviewed Mike a couple of years ago, and Giselle tells me, I haven't talked to Mike about it yet, tells me that Mike thinks the Hispanic woman is the driving force of the economy in this country. And uh, I got to talk to Mike about it and get a little more insight. That is what he said. Anyway, quickly, before I can finish, so diversity and inclusion. Uh, one thing we haven't done much in, and I really do, employment in the not-for-profit. When you aggregate not-for-profits, you're talking about one of the biggest employers in this country. And uh, you get to a point where I really think uh, over the next 20, 20, 25 years, for one good reason, two bad reasons, there's going to be tremendous growth in the not-for-profit employment area. The good reason is incredible amounts of wealth being transferred uh, over the next 20, 25 years. Yes, the family members, I think the not-for-profit world will be a beneficiary. The two bad reasons, are the aging of the population and the squeeze on the middle class. The need for not-for-profits and government to help out these you know, groups of people out there. My other reason for really wanting to do not-for-profit employment, a major theme of ours at Working Nation is the link between employment and purpose in life. Who's read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's, Man's Search for Meaning? Okay. <laughs> uh, Send me an email with your physical address and you will get a copy of the book. Giselle Fernandez came to me first quarter of 16 and with the movie rights to it, I didn't want to make a movie. I was doing this working nation, but I was aware of the work. It caused me to write, read the book. And I was already thinking about the link between employment and purpose in life. And it was something that when I'm confronted by, uh, you know, with universal basic income, you know, my answer is that's just money. But what about the whole purpose side? And I don't care whether it's you guys, me, Jane, but also the assembly line worker. You know, they get up Monday morning, they go to work. They're part of the team. They produce, they bring home income, feed, educate the family. They're part of the community. And so that's an important theme of ours. We've done, we did a big town hall event with the nine or 10 top religious leaders. Everyone representing a different religion speaking on what they were seeing in their communities, plus this whole link between employment and purpose in life. And I, again, with the emails, we'll yeah. send you some links to some of this stuff. Uh, older workers, uh, you know, given longevity, ex you know, extending older workers, and we've worked closely, Paul Irving, who sits on, you know, heads up Milken Institute Center for Aging, I sit on that board. Uh, we've done a lot, we're gonna do a lot more. That's a big issue. Uh, in this uh, country coming up. Uh, healthcare employment. That's why I was meeting with the CEO of the University of Pennsylvania healthcare system last week. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to talk about doctors and nurses, but home healthcare workers, one of the fastest growing. Telemedicine, there's all kinds of jobs and employment in healthcare that, you know, the stories ought to be told. And so young and older people can adapt to that, uh, older workers. Uh, based on the comment there, internships, apprenticeships, and national service. We've done a whole lot on internships, apprenticeships. I want to start talking about national service. Uh, I'm not talking about Israel style, you know, going into the military. 
I'm talking about stuff on a localized basis. And I do believe one of the reasons I want to talk about it, I think young people are going to have tougher times getting jobs as a result of the pandemic. And so we ought to be developing interesting programs to you know, lead them into that employment world. And I think you know, really important stuff can be done. Uh, into autism awareness and employment, we are dedicating the month of April uh, to that. Um, yeah, I spoke at a town hall event and uh, a woman who was on all, and she was very much uh, engaged in that, uh, connected with her, with Joan Lynch, who heads up all of our content development. Joan fell in love with the idea, so we didn't dedicate the month of uh, April to that. Anyway, Monia, anything else? Just questions and answers. Okay, I questions, think. answers. I got answers. <laughs> I think we got a lot of questions at dinner. Okay. There's like 10 people waiting for you already. Okay. And the rest of whatever whatever you guys want. Wait, one more question. This question. Last question. So um, outside of not-for-profit, have you thought about other forms of capital formation and alternatives to employment specifically? Because that's kind of what we're seeing as a trend, like decentralized autonomous corporations and more like geek economy style self self-employment. Um yeah, I've thought, as I mentioned, from an investment, I do a lot of stuff from an investment standpoint. And given that this is, you know, 20 hours of my day, uh, the other four, I'm focused because of this and because of the range of connections. And, you know, people you know, have all kinds of knowledge. You know, I, I'll be frank, I'm a gatherer of knowledge. You know, it's not like I you know, thought of all this, it's that, you know, it's how to pick the brains of people like yourselves. And so the answer is yes, I'm, I do think a lot about the, you know, about the uh, for-profit opportunities that come along with, uh, you know, understanding this. Because I mean, employment is a fairly recent occurrence throughout human evolution, right? It's a lot of transitory, right? And a lot of the externalities that we're all facing right now are externalities on, on how we um, accumulate capital. Basically, the principle of for profit corporations will be to have a constant misalignment of participants, including employees or specific employees. Uh, that's a big subject. It's a great, <laughs> it's a great dinner conversation. <laughs> that's a big <laughs> subject. <laughs> Uh, any other quick question? <laughs> okay. I think Lania has circulated your contact information and we'll also circulate it after the event. But listen, fantastic art. And any way we can help you, we're going to do it. So, Marty, thank you.